I will uh, take in my remarks, I think, the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, approach uh, from my predecessor. So I come to this as a lawyer and as a lawyer whose uh, main uh, focus of activity is European law. So I will try to provide some notes on how a patent holdup is framed within European laws. And I put an S because I hope to uh, put uh, the uh, member state laws also in the picture. So the starting points for my analysis are, are the following. So this is a bit trite to say, but nonetheless, standardization has become strategic both for the firms involved in, uh, with it and for society. Uh, it's a kind of, I mean, we have different types of standards, but standards now as we know them in uh, mobile communications and in some of the other uh, computing uh, areas, ICT areas, uh, it influences the industry structure. It's a kind of power where the industry comes together and decides uh, what are we going to do, what is the next step, and it also decides the innovation path. Which way are we going to go? Which innovations are coming uh, in the next generation of equipment? Uh, and it's not good or bad in itself. Uh, we have to see what the alternatives are. And the alternatives are either we have somehow a single technology that wins the upper end, and it can be proprietary or it can be open, or we have a battle of, of solutions. Uh, we have that going on in the video games industry, and that's also fine. Uh, but we also need to know, and I think it's a point that's not sufficiently emphasized in the literature, uh, there's path dependency and standardization. Certainly, the, the European experience is that once something is standardized, well, you're not going to go back to a battle of competing solutions. You're going to keep on developing new generations of, of standards. So what would be the best outcome, as I see it as a lawyer, based on the uh, literature from a social perspective, from a social planner perspective, you want to have a standard that meets the user requirements. So it needs to be adopted. It needs to be a job well done, technically speaking. Uh, it should be successful. It should be widely diffused and widely used. So we reap the benefits from standardization. Uh, you want to have the incentives sufficiently preserved for all players for the future so that since it's path dependent, you want to have next generation of standards coming up. Uh, even if there's some shorter cost, you can't always have the uh, optimal uh, in the short term. And uh, the cost of establishing and administering the standards should be minimized. It's something that lawyers often pay more attention to, the world of transaction costs. You don't want to spend too much energy, too much resources establishing and administering the standard if you can help it. So. Going now more specifically to the patent disputes. They concern, as we saw, essentially standard essential patents, SCP, uh, that are encumbered by friend commitments. So the starting point is these are patents, and, and they're probabilistic. Uh, we've all heard about the large number of patents involved. So in 3G, uh, we're looking in the thousands, and 4G as well. Uh, so you have large number of patents, uh, and we all know that from, you know, from all we know about the working of the patent system, uh, patents are granted. They're not always uh, all valid. Some of them will be invalid. Some of them will be valid. It's a probabilistic business. And you have large number involved. So uh, essentially, negotiations take place uh, for portfolio licenses. And as we heard from the previous uh, speaker, these are tough negotiations. There's a lot at stake. Uh, and of course, firms are going to go at it uh, and be tough with one another. Uh, so what is the situation? On the part of the implementer, you negotiate. What are the outside options? The outside option is to challenge the validity of the patents in question or challenge the infringement. And in the case of standard essential patents, if there is no infringement, the worth of the patent is severely affected. It has almost the same effect as a finding of invalidity. But while, when doing so, of course, you move out of the probabilistic state. You take a patent that was somewhat valid, and you turn it into a patent that is either valid or not, or either infringe or not. Uh, for the ECP holder, it's the same thing. We're conducting negotiations. There is an outside option. And the outside option, if things go really bad, is to seek an injunction against the implementer. And the implementer will defend against the injunction. And then you get the same pattern. You move out of the probabilistic state. There will be some finding made whether the patent is valid or not, whether it's infringed or not. And then the probabilistic environment is removed. So this is the context of the uh, dispute and of the negotiations. 
So if you look at what type of scenarios could arise, so the first scenario is, I think, the scenario that is observed most often in practice, parties negotiate. And again, these are tough negotiations. And if parties don't manage to uh, agree on what is a reasonable rate, then they go to arbitration or they go to court, uh, depending on, on the procedure, if necessary. So in principle, I would say looking at this from the perspective, my perspective as a competition lawyer, there's not, no need to intervene. It's just a tough negotiation. And I haven't seen empirical evidence that shows that these negotiations in general produce results that are not desirable. Now, there's also other scenarios. The first one is the scenario of holdup, properly understood, as was pointed out by my uh, predecessor, uh, which is that the SAP holder wants to extract exorbitant royalties from the implementer. Okay? In that context, from a competition law perspective, maybe you would have an abuse, but it would be an exploitative abuse. In principle, the SAP holder cannot want the standard to fail, because then the revenue will be uh, zero. Uh, uh, so you want to have the standard used, but at the same time, of course, you want to have a chunk of the uh, profits. Um, the opposite scenario on the part of the implementer is what I call the runaway scenario, or the reverse holdup, where the implementer wants to practice the standard without an SCP license. Okay? Typically, there's not much to say there under competition law because the implementer will rarely have market power. Uh, but the question is whether there's room for intervention under IP law. And then there's a fourth scenario, and that's the scenario that we see in recent cases, is when you have vertically integrated parties, when the SCP holder wants to use the SCP, the patent, to exclude the implementer from the market, exclude the other side, and favor its own operations. Uh, then, of course, there might be room for an exclusionary abuse. So, more specifically, in legal terms, uh, the parties negotiate and these scenarios are possible. Okay? And there are two circumstances in which parties will be led away from the negotiating table. So either they fail to reach an agreement on the royalty, or one of the parties decide this is going so bad we're going to go to the outside option or there's no negotiation. So you know, there's no will to negotiate, we're gonna use the upside option, okay? So a failure to reach agreement on royalties, I would say it's a matter of contract law, a matter of the IP law. There's a, a basis, there's a friend commitment, uh, there's a context in IP law to enable you presumably to figure out what royalty would be reasonable. It should be settled in this way. If you wanna use the outside option, injunction, or an infringement challenge, uh, then it's a matter of IP law. Can you get an injunction? And a matter of remedies or procedural law, is the injunction available? Um, and in a, an earlier piece in 2014 with uh, Jorge Padilla and Richard Taffet, uh, we looked at uh, proposals that are made to uh, regulate these procedures. And here, of course, there should be a concern that whatever intervention there is on the legal side to try to improve these procedures, these disputes, should not undermine the incentives of the parties to negotiate. Uh, you, if parties can solve it at the negotiating table from a social perspective, unless there's evidence that negotiations are systematically going against uh, uh, the social interest, uh, we should send the parties to the bargaining table and leave them there, not give them incentives to uh, go and litigate. So the first part of call should be IP law and remedies. Okay, and that's when I'm, the S in my title at European Laws uh, becomes important. Okay, so you would think, and, and that there we have to go into European specificities. Uh, injunction is some kind of equitable relief. That's the starting point if you come from America or if you've studied in an Anglo-American system. Um, so in, it is not awarded as a matter of right. Courts will look at the situation, will examine the balance of probabilities, uh, the balance of inconvenience, sorry, uh, the, um, the behavior of the parties, and so on. The problem is it's not that simple on the European continent because of the fact that injunctions are not coming from the same uh, corner. Uh, on top of that, we have harmonization, Directive 2004-48 on the enforcement of IP rights, which has specific provisions on injunctions. 
And when you read Directive 2004-48 and you see under which circumstances it has been enacted, it is clearly not a directive that is uh, meant to protect uh, or to improve the situation of implementers or of users of IP rights. It's a directive that arose out of the debate at the time where uh, many people successfully uh, linked uh, online, privacy, online piracy with uh, counterfeiting of Louis Vuitton uh, uh, handbags and went for a strong directive to help protect the interests of IP rights holders. And indeed, Article 9, Article 11 are there to ensure that member states give uh, IP right holders the ability to get interlocutory injunctions, Article 11 to get final injunctions. Article 11 says final injunction, well, you prove that your right has been breached, you're entitled to an injunction. Okay, and what we see, uh, and I studied this uh, together with my colleague Nicolo Zingales, who's here also today, in a piece, uh, we looked at how it is implemented in the member states, and we see diverging implementation. So not all member states treat injunctions for breaches of IP rights in the same way in general, and we can see even these differences in friend cases. So we have this situation where it, it varies. So how does EU competition law come into the picture at all? So what you, we've seen is that uh, in Germany, of all places, uh, it's not just the implementation of Directive 2004-48, actually it is the state of German law to start with. Uh, it is more favorable to the patent holder, especially for final injunctions, uh, so that the patent holder was able to reasonably simply or reasonably quickly obtain an injunction against an implementer. So how do you try to strike a balance when you get into disputes that involve uh, standardization and where you suspect that there might be some gaming on both sides? You need to create room in your legal process to examine or look at the conduct of the parties and make a finding that maybe this time the injunction is not justified. Since IP law does not in offer enough room to do this, competition law was brought in, and that was uh, the Orange Book case. Uh, as, let's say, uh, I will breach all principles of uh, comparative law by doing so, but you could almost see that the effect of competition law is equivalent to the effect of equity in the common law systems. It's brought in in order to uh, rein in the ambitions of the SCP holder and offer a framework to say, well, no, you might have the right to an injunction, but in this case, you won't have it because of your conduct. So competition law comes in the picture in that way. And then the commission disagrees with the way German case law has evolved, the Orange Book case, and it decides, well, we will create our own precedents under EU competition law. Okay, and once we, get the, once we go the way of involving EU competition law in the picture, we have to also realize that this will have a harmonizing effect. So other member states who might have had a decent way to look at these disputes within the framework of intellectual property remedies now have to factor in EU competition law as well. So the effect of the rulings is almost equivalent to a uh, amendment or modification to Directive 2004-48. And even, I would say, stronger because there's no implementation required. It goes straight into the laws of the member states. So, we have these two standards, as, or these two approaches, as we heard about, and it's interesting to look at them against the framework that I sketched a few minutes ago. So the Orange Book framework, to the extent it's applicable, because Orange Book concerned a de facto standard, not uh, a standard uh, arising of an organization with SCPs and so on. Um, the Orange Book standards assume that runaway is the starting point. So it assumes that the starting point is the implementer is trying to do something that, it's, that is not totally acceptable, uh, simply go away without, uh, implement the standard without really paying any uh, uh, royalty or level of royalty that is uh, too low. Uh, so Orange Book tells us, well, the patent holder is entitled to use uh, an injunction unless the implementer can prove that it has made an offer, it has uh, put money in escrow, and so on and so forth. Uh, Samsung and Motorola, the commission decisions, assume hold up an exclusion as a starting point, on the other hand. And you can see the difference in perspective immediately. 
How do you connect this with EU competition law? The Commission uh, went back to a door that it had insisted was still open in the Microsoft case and used other exceptional circumstances than the essential facilities doctrine, namely the presence of a standard essential patent and a friend commitment. And what I found personally notable, especially in Motorola, is the insistence on the part of the Commission that whatever happens, the implementer keeps the right to challenge uh, the validity or the uh, essentiality of the patent, keeps the outside option even after the conclusion of a license agreement. And the Commission says yes, because if you do otherwise, you deprive the implementer of the ability of getting a lower price by challenging the validity of the patent. Not realizing that if you do this, of course, uh, you leave an, an option uh, available to the implementer, and this has a price. So typically, if I was an SCP holder in that framework, I would ask for a higher royalty, because my counterpart has the option of challenging the validity of my patent going forward. So you can't have it both ways. You, can't have, you cannot have a low royalty or a reasonable royalty based on a probabilistic environment and the option to get out of the probabilistic environment if it suits you. Uh, Huawei follows the reasoning of the Commission. We will discuss it certainly in greater detail later on today. So just a few comments. Uh, what you see is that the court case doesn't really tell us about the theory of harm. It makes sense as an exclusionary case, but it's not so obvious that it would apply in an exploitative uh, setting. Uh, the steps here, uh, we will discuss them in greater detail today, I'm sure. Prior notice, a specific written offer by the SCP holder, and the lack of a diligent response by the implementer. And here as well, uh, the court follows the commission in uh, holding that the implementer may reserve the right to challenge validity and infringement uh, even after the, uh, the license has been uh, granted. So in conclusion, what we see is that patent disputes occur against a very complex legal backdrop in the EU, harmonized IP law with different implementations uh, from one member state to the other, and competition law comes in as a kind of white knight to streamline the procedure, uh, but a white knight with some shortcomings. So the theory of harm, in my view, is not well articulated, so I, I try to show you that it relies on assumptions that may not necessarily be the assumptions that empirical evidence would support. Uh, EU competition law continues to be informed by this idea that there is a right price uh, for the uh, intellectual property that was already there in the Microsoft case. Uh, and it ignores the fact that negotiations take place over portfolios and in a probabilistic context. And indeed, you see interference in the reasoning of the Commission, not so much that of the court, but it's clear in the reasoning of the Commission. You see uh, there's an underlying misgiving about the problem or the fact that so many patents are involved, some kind of skepticism about the quality of the patents involved, which may or may not be warranted as a matter of public policy, but it may not be what competition law is supposed to, to solve. So thank you.